Thank you. Kids, uh, those, uh, yeah, whoever's going out and, wow, you don't want to hear me preach? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're all leaving. Yeah. Uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here today, and uh, I'll try to get right to it. Uh, I'm ringing up here, so something's either on or I'm a little too loud. Um, I'm glad you're here, and I want to share a couple of announcements before we go right into the Word. And one is Chris, uh, uh, Rod's wife, Chris, uh, is uh, father is in surgery this morning, today, sometime this afternoon. This afternoon. Um, uh, penicitis. Keep them in, in prayer, and continue to pray for Chris as she's healing. And uh, so, just want you to know that and keep that in mind. And, and your prayers. Also, want to just updating the things that just need to be said. Is building update is uh, being some kind of putting that together and everything is where we're at. And this week we've had a lot of things happening. We have so much happening in our home and and all of that. Uh, we close in our house on Thursday. We buy our new house on Friday. Uh, we had our garage sale the last couple of days. We're exhausted. Um, my heart's doing a couple extra beats. That's why I'm sitting there. I'm trying to get to calm down a little bit. Now I'm going to wind it up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I do that. Um, but at the same time, it's really awesome. I, I want to report, I shared last Sunday, is uh, I've gone three and a half almost now, uh, four weeks, uh, without any pain meds at all since my stroke three years ago, March 3rd. And I, I'll never forget that day, and I still have some blindness and all, but it's really awesome. I was sharing my cardiologist this week, and I have uh, updating things, checking things out there, and he says, man, that's awesome. He says... Uh, that doesn't always happen, but there's something that has changed in pressure on the one side of my brain. So maybe I think a little better, maybe not. I don't know, but I hope so. And I, I give God the glory for that. And Amen. it's nice to be off of one of those meds that kind of helps you, but buzzes you at the same time. I've been so used to it all the time. The building we uh, got to this week, uh, the plans back and approved from Pickaway County. Um, and we have it stamped, and we are ready with Pickaway County. We're waiting for the township to give us approval, and we won't get that until probably May 19th. We have a hearing. We have to go before them and plead to them why we would want to have an addition put onto the bill. Uh, even though we've qualified everything in our easement, the only thing that they really have concern for is whether we have setbacks. They have no control over the building design and everything and all that. They have just setbacks. But they like to have control. Uh, so anyway, for $500, they get to sit down and grill you. And I've been through one of those before, so be in prayer because they can irritate you. But anyway, and then outside of that, it'll, it'll be all right. And then the other thing that happened this week for sure, um, I got to... Uh, Interviewed and questioned and grilled by uh, Samaritan's Purse officially. Uh, they came and spent an hour and ten minutes questioning me everything from a doctor to you name it. And we are going to be officially, now I can say, officially collection site for uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child this fall. Yay. And uh, it will be held here. We will be the nearest church of All Grove City, uh, all south side of Columbus. Awesome. I need volunteers. And I told them, and they said, where are you going to put them all? I said, in that new building. And I showed them the, the, the plans there, and they're looking around, and they're saying, you don't believe you're going to do it. I said, yeah. I, and I was just holding I just came back from Pickaway County. I was holding the plans. I said, see here? I've got, I've got the approval. Now, um, we, we uh, have done really well in promissory notes. We're doing good, good there. We do need about 5000 more in cash. And, and uh, keep raising that part, and uh, every every bit helps. And I'm hoping that we will break ground June one, um, and talking with the uh, contractors, our subcontractors that we'll be doing. We will be the general contractor. The church is, and we will be hiring uh, the subcontractors. So that's I, I think it's important. I let you know that and what's happening there. Now turn your Bibles to Romans chapter fourteen. We're going to do an entire chapter. I've been going through the book of Romans for about a year and a half. And whenever I preach, I've been continuing Romans, and uh, we're coming to 14. Now, 14, 15, and 16 go kind of fast. And uh, they are um, their application and personal notes and things like that that Paul the Apostle has. And uh, so what, what I have to do in kind of prerequisite on this is 
And I thought, man, when I read the chapter, I thought, this is all one sermon. This is all one. I know it'll scare people to death, but I'm going to do a whole chapter in one because I can do a whole message in one verse. But uh, there's 23 verses. And we'll go through most of the verses, but uh, we might skip a few verses here and there. But you'll get the idea of it as it goes along. There's only two points to it, though. Isn't that good? I've come up to sometimes to say that I've got seven points today. <laughs> I only have two points. But here's the message. Trying to change others doesn't work. Amen. Okay? If you got that now, you get them to leave. All right? But if you really get that down, you understand. Trying to change others doesn't really work. Have you tried? Yes. You tried to change somebody? How many young couples get together, you know, and they think they're going to get married, and she's going to change him? No way. <laughs> Or, or, you know, vice versa. He thinks that she's going to change, you know. No Has it worked yet? Any testimonies? No. All right. All right. See, so anybody ever thinks about that, young people that are not married, uh, let me tell you, uh, no. What you see is what you get. <laughs> right. You don't change a whole lot. Now, you do kind of evolve. I know I can see my wife and I have kind of evolved, and, you know, you blend, and you know, some things that you start changing. But it's not because I changed her or she changed me. It's just that you start blending some things. You know, you start working together. It's that or else you just go to butt heads. I mean, what do you want to do? All right, yeah. And so you start, you know, working on some of those things. But one of the things in life is that we really do have challenges is that we try to change other people. And, and uh, you know, we don't try to change ourselves as much as we try to change them. You haven't noticed that? The world is all about that, you know. Everybody else is wrong, I'm right, right, you know. And there's kind of that attitude. And it seems like it's a favorite pastime of people is judging other people's motives, you know. And, 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 and judging their spirituality. Well, I don't think that they're really where they ought to be. Or trying to just plain change them to be more like us. And who said we were so hot? You know what I mean? And that's where we go really wrong. And that's where many churches have really fail in reaching the world and reaching with the gospel of Christ. Jesus didn't come to try to, you know, say, you need to be more like me. He just set the example that people wanted to be like him. You ever notice that? You know, see, the woman, that, the woman that's taken an adultery, he didn't say, be like me! He just said, go, sin no more. And you see, in the approach that he did, and the approach and the way he did things, and that's what Paul's going to do. He's going to say, listen, this is where, we, it's where we're coming from here. Because the attitude that, you know, sometimes I don't know, well, God's pleased with me, so, so the way I live, so I need to change everybody else around me to be more like me, is all wrong. You know, we watch other people, and they, well, their language isn't as clean as it ought to be. You know, they're a little coarse in the way they talk. And, well, they, they drink and they smoke and they party and on week, they work on Sundays, they do this and that. that and that lady, she wears too much makeup and, and I tell you, I, I, I just can't take that. And you know that church down there, they play musical instruments, you know. And then that church down there, they don't have a, a piano and, a, and a, an organ and they have cars and drums, you know. And a few years back, that was a huge issue. I'll never forget years ago. I was pastor, it was 1974. 1975, and a young man came to their church, and he came from some state, I forget where, and he was a talented trombone player. And man, he could play. And I said, man, would you play a... We had offertory in those days, you know? I said, would you play the offertory a trombone? He could play. You know, it was so beautiful. And so he got to play trombone. I thought, wow, isn't this awesome, everybody? Oh, man, we had to have a deacon's meeting right after the church. What do you mean? A trombone was on the stage. You playing? I thought, what did I do? I almost got fired. You know, and I thought, man, let alone. And then I'll never forget. And one of the old men says, next thing you know, there'll be a guitar right there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, where are we? You know? And, and you know, things have changed. And, and, and uh, <laughs> brother, brother Hoop, you, you weren't there right that time. You got saved out of that. But, you know, uh, things changed. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and it's amazing how we get the kind of rituals. We think these rituals are holy. They're not the Word of God, but they're holy. We have to be careful about that. And that's really what Paul's going to start addressing some of these things. You see, we got all kinds of ideas. There's some people who think you can't have zippers, you've got to have buttons, you know? There are certain societies as such and that. And then there you go, that the hair's too long. Look at that Ben. His hair's way too long. And look at that guy there, his hair way too short. 
<laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah, you see? And, and then that dress is too short and that dress is too long. Why, she looks like she's an old Pentecostal and that one. Well, what, what she does, Lucy? I mean, you know, my like, heels are too long and they're too short. And we go on and on. Why, did you see that guy? Yeah, that holds his hands. Why, he's up there with the band and he's playing it. Well, he does it today. <laughs> yeah. And we get these kind of things. And what are we doing? We're judging. Ah, that's what we're doing. We're judging spirituality by those things. And then we start looking at, well, they drive an expensive car. And then we look down and say, oh, this pastor's using an electronic Bible. Why don't you get an electronic Bible? I see you have a paper one today. <laughs> oh, but look at that. The pastor's wife's got an electronic Bible. Oh, she's gone the way of the world. <laughs> you know? The thing of it is, with electronic Bibles, you can punch in about three different versions, and all it's all right there, you know? And, and, and I've gotten to the point, it's really not bad. I can pull out, I have my Bible right here. I, I sometimes, if I forget my larger one, I sit there with Pastor Tim, and I just pull it up on my iPhone. It is the greatest thing God has given to us is some of these things. And but we judge. Now, that doesn't mean I don't bring it. I still, I have my Bible, yes. And I mark it, oh yes, yes, I use it faithfully. But you see, we got to be careful about these kind of things. And that, uh, then we start saying, well, they don't give enough, they don't pray enough, they don't read enough, they don't do enough, they don't have enough. You're not me. We try to change people and it doesn't work. I want to tell you, honest goodness, truth story. This happened many, 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 many years ago. An evangelist friend was sitting down on a luncheon thing and come to, to Griffin. Uh, we had several churches to come together and do an evangelist crusade. And uh, I was down in South Carolina. And uh, I was meeting with him, and he was talking, and he says, you know, <clears throat> we got to watch out about these traditions, where we come from, where I come from, and whatnot, and we start making them holy. And then he said, that I was in Germany, and I was with a, a group of ministers, and we're having a luncheon, and we're having a great crusade in this little town, and I forget what the name of the town was in Germany. And he says, I, and they want to know, how are things in America? And he says, oh, man, things are, things are really in decay. Now, this is in the 70s. He says, man, the, the, the drugs and the, and, and the pot and the smoking and the carrying on, the drinking and the sexual revolution that's carried on, the short dresses, the makeup going on, they replaced the organ with guitars, they're going on and on and on. And he said, and he saw these men and they started to weep. And they're crying and they're crying, their tears are running down their cigars into their beer. <laughs> and he says, yeah, honest to goodness truth. And I sat there and I watched it and I thought, and if America see that, it's a whole of the liberal Germans. <laughs> the preachers are sitting there smoking cigars at the luncheon, yeah. And we do, we get a lot of stereotypes. Now, what is spiritual and what isn't? Now, see, I know that some of the things I've said already, you say, well, I don't like that. Somewhere I've said something, you say, well, I don't like that either, you know? <laughs> and there's things that, that we kind of, we say, oh, well, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't buy that. Imagine for a moment, you know, what it was like back in Paul's day. You think it's a lot different? Romans 14 is, is an ethics chapter. And the premise is brought on by chapter 13. And chapter 13 is all about the nature of the Christian life is to love and to serve. And this is the whole sum of chapter 13, last time I preached. Love must be genuine. Love is submissive to authority. Love is withheld from no one. Okay? Love is to be given to everyone. May I all love them? Love them. Because God loves them. Amen. They may not be lovable. Okay? May not be your best friend. And love must be patient. How patient is God with you? Mm, okay, that's your, that's your standard. Now that's where it begins. Now, come to chapter 14. On that premise as we go to chapter 14. Part 1. Don't reject those who are weak in the faith. That's point 1. Don't reject those who are weak in the faith, or that you consider weak in the faith. They're a new Christian, a new believer, they're just new to church. And suddenly, you know, they don't behave, they don't act the way you think they should, and then you say, oh, 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 they just, you know, oh, I don't know, yeah. And we get these opinions, and we start, and they get that vibe, 
They would get it from you, whether it's a neighbor or well, I just don't approve the way they. And you know, one of the things is we've got to, we got to accept and embrace people. Did Jesus embrace people? He went out where they were and embraced them where they were. He loved them into the kingdom. Folks, that's an example of the church where it would be the same way. Welcome them. Whoever, whatever they've done, it doesn't matter. Welcome them. Now that's the premises. Now look at this in verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But not to quarrel over opinions. There's your statement. You don't welcome him in so we, well, we're going we're gonna to set him down. We're going to correct him and make him just like us. You really want everybody like you? I don't know if that's so good. <laughs> Do you think you're that holy? Do you think you're that right? Be careful. Be careful. You see, it's really easy to reject those who disagree with us and, and to ignore them. You see? But he says, accept them without correcting them. Just accept them. Where they are, allow the Holy Spirit, allow God to be God and you to be a friend. Allow God the Holy Spirit to correct them. You're not the corrector. If I, show me a verse. Show me a verse. Be careful. Holy Spirit's the corrector. Holy Spirit's the teacher. We're to be ones that share the gospel and the set example of the gospel as we have been convicted to live our Christian life. Now, there's principles for that, and we'll get to that in, in, in a minute. You see, it's really easy for us to say, well, I don't believe in it. Well, I don't believe that, you know. Yeah, and we go on and on. So he uses two illustrations. And the one is, in verse 2, one person believes that he can eat, eat, eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Okay, we've got a vegan in the group here. Oh, oh, I tell you, they're crazy people. I tell you what, they won't eat any kind of meat at all. You know, those vegans, you know. Well, you got the next person, they say this. Well, I believe they understand. Well, see, that's when they have the problem with there's kosher and there's non-kosher, and they can have pork and they couldn't have pork. Now, there's a real principle why God did the pork thing and why he did it. It wasn't just pork, but it's camel and there's buzzards and there's anything that was unclean, is what it's called, unclean animals. And if you go into historical uh, facts and historical uh, facts of civilization, you will find the Jews lived a longer age than any other civilization around them. Why? Because God gave them a food dietary law. He knew. They didn't have refrigerators. And they didn't know how to preserve. And they didn't know how to clean and take care of things. So he says, all right, guys, you don't eat this, 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 and this. And then when Peter came along in, in the book of Acts, and he says, now, Peter, you can eat anything. Anything's clean because I've created it. You've got to understand. I have reasons why I did that for the people of Israel. They would have gone to stink, would have died, and there would have been no Jews left. And the gospel would never ever come. So he had a purpose. He, he knew what he was doing. And you see, when I think about this, I think it's really, it's amazing that in this whole illustration, it's that, you know, that it's not a matter of kosher at all. And Jews really get hung up on that. And I like to laugh about that. I'm a free Jew, you know, because I can eat pork and say, you know, sausage and, you know. And can you imagine when Paul was saved? He was a Pharisee. And can you imagine when he was saved when he was trying to come to the freedom of Jesus? And the first time he's out on a, on a, a trip and, 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 and missions, and he's gone out to a foreign city and he's sitting down with them and they say, hey, you hungry? Yeah! And they hand him a ham sandwich. And he goes, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, if I do, you know, I'm going to be condemned. They're going to condemn me to sound just like the heathen. If I don't, I'm going to offend them. You know? <laughs> I, I would love to see the look on his face the first time he had to eat a ham sandwich, you know? Yeah, but see, that was kind of a thing. And, and Paul, he came to the point saying, I, I, can, I can do it. I can do it. Because I realized what God has taught. He said, no, now he told Peter, everything is clean. You're allowed to. You see, it had been, it had been really awkward there. But you see, if God accepts us just as I am, why don't we accept others? Mm -hmm. No, he goes on. He says in verse 3, let no one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let no one who abstains pass a judgment on one who eats. For God has welcomed him. You see, that's where he's got. You got a vegan in the group? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you got a vegan in the group? You won't touch meat? Don't condemn the rest of us meat eaters. You meat eaters? Don't condemn the vegan. 
Okay? They may have their reasons. They may feel it's the right thing for them. Don't worry about it. That's not your concern, is it? Okay? You see? I'm going to go home. I'm going to have some meat. Yeah? I, I mean, it's okay. It's okay. You go home and have your salad. Okay. You're going to be hungry later. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that, that's the way it goes. Now, and then he goes on and he, says, and he says, illustration number two, verse five. No person esteems one day as better than the other. While another seems all days alike, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes a day observes it in the honor to the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord, since we, he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in the honor to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Let none of us live, his, live to himself and none of us dies to himself. Illustration to his days. You see, in the first century, what was happening? Some were saying, oh, no, 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 we've got to gather. We can only worship on the Sabbath. Because Old Testament law says, you know, that's, that's going to be the holy day, and that's the only day that we can worship on. And somebody says, no, 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 no. Jesus said an example when he rose from the dead, and they, they gathered everybody on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And everybody, all the disciples started gathering on the first day of the week, on Sunday. Well, Sunday's the only day now. We don't worship on the Sabbath land. We're not under the law. We're under our own New Testament. We're free to do whatever. And the next day comes, like, oh, come on, I'm going to worship every single day of the week. Oh, man, yeah, you think you're spiritual or something, don't you? You guys are going to do that, you know? And he's saying, making the point there, making a really real point. You want to worship on Sabbath? Go out on Saturday? Go ahead and worship on Saturday. You want to worship on Saturday, Sunday? Go ahead and worship on Sunday. You want to worship on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? You want a Saturday night service? Go ahead! Just do it in honor to the Lord. Not to try to outdo everybody else and say, well, I'm right and you're wrong. There are groups that are literally out there, there are denominational groups that say, the rest are going to hell and the mark of the beast is on them because they're in church on Sunday. Did you know that? Yes. I won't name the group. Isn't that amazing yes. that you can judge others? God's the judge. You're not. Is there any day that we cannot worship God? Is there any day that's withheld? In fact, he says every day we're to honor the Lord. Every day we're to worship Him. Every day we're to praise Him. So he's given that illustration here again. Be careful where you get. You get these old traditions and whatnot. Why? Why is this so important? Now, first, we don't live for others. We live for God. That's why. We, we will live for God. We are His workmanship created for His glory. Ephesians 2.10 We... For me to live is Christ, to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. What does it profit a man if a man gains a whole world but loses his soul? Matthew 16.26. Why? We live for God. We don't live for ourselves. Who do you live for? Do you live for what people think of you? Or are you just living for what God thinks of you? You see, we get all kinds of traditions, you know. One person says, well, I, I don't want anything to do with Halloween. And the other says, well, I don't care. I don't, I, I don't care what the old, you know, what the traditions are. One says, well, I can't have Christmas time. I can't have pre presents, or I can't have treats, or I can't have decorations, or I can't have this. I says, man, I'm going to load my house up with every kind of treat that there is. I don't really care. Do what your conscience says is right that will honor God. I have a little problem about all the other junk out there. You know, the yard art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the yard art, you know, they got um, 15 blow-ups all over everything, has nothing to do with Jesus and everything. And we've gotten our tradition, for us, you know, we've been doing trees, because tree uh, in our whole front, all white trees, and everybody in our neighbors and all, and people say, wow, it's beautiful. The tree is a symbol of life, and the tree is a symbol of, is the, and, you know, it's the evergreen. I come from the West. I was taught different about evergreen trees and used, used for Christmas. And that is a symbol of evergreen, the life that God gives to us. And Jesus, the light of the world. And so and when people ask me, why do you put trees I tell them, because it reminds me of Jesus. I, to, I want to use it to honor Him. You see what I mean? Okay, so whatever your conviction is, and make it a conviction that honors Him. You know? And I put a Santa up there, you know, and a big old snowman, Frosty, and a cigar out. I don't know how I'm going to honor Jesus. You know, so I have a problem with that one, you see. For personally, if you can figure that one out and say, well, this reminds me of Jesus. Well, I don't know how that would work. Yeah. You see, but 
You see, so that's where I'm not going to judge somebody else. I can't start judging them and say, well, they're all wrong and I'm right. I've got to be careful about that. And so then it goes on in verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you pass judgment on your brother? The weak in faith are, 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 are judges in bondage. Leave them alone. Or why do you why do you despise your brother? For we we all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to me. Who do you answer to ultimately? God. Yeah. Got it. You got you got the whole point here. You 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 answer to God. Then your values and your whole value system must be. One that answers to God. Every knee bows to him. Answers to him. That's what he's trying to teach you there. You see, a, legal, a legalist is defined as this. as someone who lives in fear that someone somewhere is enjoying himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to stop that. You know? That's what a legalist is. You know, and, and, and he's sour. He wants everybody else just as sour as he is and be just as rigid as he is. And, and illegalism is not a lot of fun. Have you been in a legalist church? You know, I, I have. For years to get, I was sure, as a kid, you know, and it was really kind of being pretty sour pussy. You know, in the back rows, and you watch them, go, hmm, did you see that one come in? Why, the preacher didn't have a coat on. How can he do that? He didn't have a tie on. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't have a mic on. Yeah, he didn't have a mic on. You know? And I lost my little thingy. Can you do that? Can I be up there? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I kind of hope so, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and see, we get we get traditions that well, that's the only proper way is is that you got to be the, that way. You got to be the way I was dressed a minute ago. That's the only way you can be. You know? Well, where do we where do we get that from? Well, Paul the Apostle. What? Oh, he had a rope on <laughs> and a turban on. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm going to look like an Arab then, you know. <laughs> you really want that, you know. You see, we, we get these ideas, and that's that's thing says, no, 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 no. We answer to God, we give account to God, and God alone. He's the one. The Christian life is not a bunch of don'ts. And the world has an idea that that's the way the Christian life is. It's don'ts. When the Christian life is do. It's all about doing. Doing for God and doing for others. That's what the Christian life is all about. That which we are, we're going to give account to Him for what we have done. Not what we don't, but what we do. You understand that? Isn't that a, a fundamental, important fact? I, I, I was just thinking about that the other day. I thought, yeah, that's so simple. We give an account for what we do, not for what we don't do. You see, when you have a list of don'ts, you don't do nothing. You just sit there. And then you're not in the game. You're not out there doing anything. I've heard too many Christians say something like, well, I'm afraid to witness because I might just screw them up. You know? I'll, I'll push them away. They're already away from Jesus. You can't push them any farther if they're lost. You know? Just allow God to use you. We've had, a, we've had a garage sale for the last few days at our house. Wore me out. I mean, to the point I not have a, a meter. My, my, my doctor likes me to keep and told me, he says, yeah, that's a good thing to use it. Keep, you know, and it says how many steps and all that and everything, you know. I keep it in my pocket most of the time, all the time. And in the last few days, doing that garage sale from my barn to the house and dragging stuff when I did, I did 10,600 steps on Friday and over 5.2 miles. <laughs> I was exhausted by the other day. But you know what? I found in doing it, I kept talking to people and, and, and they pick up a plaque and I, I started thinking, okay, how can I? And, 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 and there's this way I had this one uh, clock we've had for years, and, but we don't have a place in the new house. We've got it sides down. Ask for my house who will serve the Lord. I said, oh man, if, if you buy this, this is precious, you know. And I told a little about the verse. I said, if you buy this, I hope that you, you'll honor this. I don't want you to buy it just because it's pretty. I want you to buy it because it has meaning. And she didn't do me down the time. <laughs> and she bought it. She said, I will. I will. I thought, use it 
every opportunity. Can I use a garage sale to witness? Yes. I should be able to use everything that I do to do everything. What? To honor Him. To the glory of God. You know? That's the way we need to be. That's our lifestyle. So there's some important conclusions and facts I come to here. One, you're not responsible to change your brother. Okay? You're not responsible to change your brother. God is. God chooses, God saves, God changes. You don't. You're placed here to be an instrument to help them, encourage them. And see, my job is to teach the Word. My job is to follow Him and be an example. My job is to tell the truth of the Word. Your job is to hear the Word, allow the Holy Spirit to apply it to your life. Take heed. The other thing I learned in these, these passages here is God reads the heart. God sees man, what man cannot see. God knows motives. We have some of them, yeah, everything, God? i got to tell you, Facebook is really crazy. That's all not. I heard about one just uh, th this week, you know, in that, you know, well, the stern's moving. I mean, more people know about our move than we know. Okay. It's put it on Facebook. We yeah. didn't put it on Facebook. Everybody else had, you know. But the, the movie day. But even before that, before that. And, and so, so there's, there's one is, he's moving into the subdivision. Don't you think there's something kind of strange about that? He's selling that house. Really nice. Nothing wrong with that. That big house, he's, he's moving to a smaller. What do you think is going on? Mm. <laughs> None of your business. No, I mean, isn't that some silliness? But you see, that's how the world thinks. Uh, you know, I, I tell you, it's been a whirlwind for us. We sold the house in 20, 24 hours. We had a contract, 24 hours. Then when we got our home, four days later, we had a contract in another home. You know? And, and, and I mean, it's been a whirlwind. We, we went through this garage sale, and everything, everything major that we wanted, it, it's, gone, it's gone. Everything that we thought, oh, man, this is, okay, God is doing something for us and working in our own life. Praise God. And, and so you, you, you don't know hearts. You don't know motives. You, don't, you, know, you, you just say, well, isn't that neat? God, you know, he, he sees where God's working in his life. Why are you going, oh, there must be something strange. Well, that's just the way people get to doing. You see, they think it's their business on everything, you know. And uh, when it isn't, I guess. The third thing I do learn about in this passage is judging others is bonding. Judging others is bondage. When you start judging people, you start becoming a master trying to enslave people. And, and, and living is living for Christ's liberty. And, and, you know, when, when you just live, you know, Lord, they're your responsibility, not mine, is liberty. You know, whether, whether I see this brother or sitting here, that whether he's growing as fast as I think or not, doesn't ruin my business, is it? I just need to keep teaching the Word. If I see this one over here, it's he's really starting to study the Word. I get excited. I see that wonderful, you know. You see, I, I don't need to read more. Well, I don't think he's praying enough. I think that's it. You know, one, two, three, three, three. We don't need to be doing that. And that's what he's trying to warn us about here. If we live for God then we die leaving a legacy for God. If we live for self, then we die with the meaningless masses of the world with no memory or lasting significance. If we live for God, we're liberated. We're free. If we live for self, we're dying continually in the drama and the reality shows and the pains and the plots and the lashing out and trying to control others and manipulating and whatnot. You know a whole world like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're in this bondage. It's called sin. Now, part two is really short. And that is in verse 13. He says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Don't pass judgment beyond God's word. And God says, adultery is wrong. Then you can say, uh, I'm sorry, brother, I need to tell you, that's sin. Fornication is wrong. Stealing is wrong. There are commands, they're very clear. Black and white. 
But whether that brother wears pink or not, okay? Well, hey, that's his choice. I'm not wearing pink, but he can wear pink, all right? That's my son, so I can do that. <laughs> no, I'm just not mad enough for it right now. <laughs> but you see, see, we get to judge it. I wonder, maybe, maybe. Ah, yeah. oh, be careful. Be careful. About judging other people's intense thoughts. Because you don't know what God knows. If you have a real concern, pray for the brother in pain. <laughs> you know, <laughs> He'll work pink more often and more prayers for me. <laughs> right, hey. yeah. I love that people that are praying for me every day. You know, the preacher work pink every Sunday. You know? Oh, that's okay. So he gives us a principle here, not to pass judgment on one another. And he goes on and says, why? Because, because you may be free to partake in anything, but don't take liberties of doing whatever you want at the cost of your witness. He said in verse 14, I know that I am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Remember about chapter 13. Um, by what you eat, do not destroy the one who Christ has died. You find a vegan, and you go out to eat with him. And they're really offended about people eating meat. And they have to tell you stories about how chickens are slaughtered or whatever. Then don't order chicken. And just to offend, I didn't eat chicken for you. Yeah. yeah, that's what he's saying. Then be, be gracious enough to say, I think I'll have a salad with you today. Go home later and get yourself a steak. All right? <laughs> yeah. But see, that, that's the principle he's saying. Don't try to offend people by your freedom. You see, you may have the right to drink or uh, dress or go to this or that or whatever and feel fine and no conscience, but don't do it in the face of somebody else that would be offensive. It may not be good for them. It may hurt them. And some things aren't good for me. You see, you may want biscuits and gravy and go out and have all of those things, but Brother Allen and I are saying, no, our cardiologist and one says it's not the best thing always to have. And you say, yeah, I can have it all I want. And I'm looking at that and say, man, you eat everything, you know? I, yeah, see, there's some things I'm free to eat and some things I'm not free to eat. Some of you are the same way. You know, and, and, and that's the principle he's trying to get to. So here's your, your guidelines it comes down to. Don't be a stumbling block. Be free to do good and encourage others. That's what we're free to do. Pursue peace. You see, there, that, that's so important. Pursue peace. Verse 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual building up. If we're not building up people, we're hurting people. And that, that's the point he wants us to understand. And then don't destroy God's work because of your opinion. Don't let your opinion come in and say, well, I think you're all wrong, but be careful. Everybody else is wrong and you're right, then be careful. <laughs> you know? That usually is the way it works. You know, we think we've got a conviction, you know? Yeah, as a Christian, we're going to tell all the other Christians how they ought to be. No, that's, he's making a, a real statement here. It's important. And your faith is between you and God. Your faith is between you and God. And when, when I say that is, enjoy your liberties, but not at an expense of hurting others, and allow God to give you your convictions of what you think is right for you and your family. But don't force them on other people. I, I love the song that I asked the, the band to sing this morning, is I Believe. And you know, if we surround ourselves with the statement of faith there, all other things is here immaterial. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection. I believe in, in His coming soon to, to take us home. Those are the essentials. I believe in being born again. I believe my sins are gone and forgiven forever. Those are the essentials. Those are what I stand on. Those are what I preach on. All the other things are immaterial. Amen. If I have a tire, I don't. It doesn't really matter, does it? If we use a guitar, we don't. It doesn't really matter. You see, that's what he's trying to teach us here. Faith builds. 
Legalism destroys, puts doubts, tears down. Faith accepts, embraces. Legalism rejects, pushes away. Faith leads to salvation. Legalism leads to bondage. And Paul the Apostle is trying to give you a very important point here. That this is how we as Christians take everything that he's been teaching and doctrine in the book of Romans to these conclusions. Here then is how we live. I have a song that uh, I meant to bring the, uh, the CD and I left it on my desk on the way out. Got to think about the message. And it's a song, it's one of my favorite songs. I told Brenda when I die, this is what I want at my funeral. Of all the songs, I love Amazing Grace and this and that and everything else, but this is a song that's written by Luther Barnes. And I listen to it whenever I'm discouraged. I listen to it, I have it on a CD. I'm thinking about it, I need to get another one before I wear it out. Okay? Brooklyn Tab does it, but uh, there, there's several versions, and I love the Brooklyn Tab version of it. I want to read the words as we conclude. I started out with Jesus at a very early age. And I love this whole song because it's just, it's me. Yes, I've known him nearly all my life. I admit there's been times when I have faltered along the way, but I'll keep trying because somehow I've got to make it in. You see, I've got a charge in my life. I've got a job to do, and I can't stop until it's through. I'm determined. I've got a made-up mind. I can't stand around wasting my time. I'm going to keep on working for Jesus every day of my life because I've got heaven on my mind. I don't have time to waste criticizing someone else. There are some things that I'd rather leave behind. And I don't have time to be bothered by what he said and she said and they said because all I can do is keep my own self in line. I must work while it's day, for night surely is coming all, and I'm, I'm all going all the way. I can't understand how some people can move so slow. Maybe they just don't know what time it is. He's coming back, and I know it won't be long. I've, I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready for my starry crown. I want to hear him say, I want to hear him say, well done. You can talk about me. You can say what you want to say. You can stand around wasting your time. And while you're talking, I'm going to keep on walking because I've got heaven on my mind. Amen. You got the point? That's chapter 14. Don't waste your time and things that don't matter. Don't waste your time. It's precious. What you've got left it's all there is. You give it to Jesus and let Him guide you, lead you, and direct you. He'll give you the convictions you need to stand. <coughs> if there's anybody here, you're not convinced and you're not following Jesus, you're following rules and everything, I want to invite you to Jesus, to freedom. Let go of the bondage and the baggage and just follow Jesus. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, to lead you. Follow Jesus. <coughs> Get heaven on your mind. And you have to change the way you look at life. Let's bow. Oh God.